uh, permit, yeah? So my name is Afshan Khan. I'm the Scaling Up uh, Nutrition Coordinator, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm very excited because we have an event that's really organized by young people um, with the full participation of young people, but I did want to be able to give a brief introduction because uh, Sophie, uh, who is our lead group member of Scaling Up Nutrition, will be arriving slightly late, so I'm stepping in to make sure that we get in on time and are taking full advantage of the panel here. So I did want to say a couple of words. What we eat impacts climate change, and climate change impacts what we eat. So feeding a growing population and a healthy, nutritious diet provided by nature-positive food systems requires both societal shifts and individual-level change. Children and young people are amongst the most vulnerable to experiencing shocks, but they're also young people amongst the first to stand up and take action. So youth, and I, and I was in a panel earlier today, it's very clear that they're at the forefront of innovation. They have the greatest stake in the future. And engaging youth and youth groups and integrating their insight into strategies and decisions is crucial for sparking the change to which we are all accountable. I think we have a real opportunity at this COP28 to listen to youth, to discuss further action, and I hope that will be the case today. Therefore, this has, event has been led by some amazing young nutrition leaders who are with us today. We can't showcase all the youth voices of the Sun Movement, nor the youth voices in this room. So we called out to the networks to ensure we heard from a wide range of young people, even though they may not all have access to the COP space. So let me invite Sean, the Civil Society Network's Advocacy and Youth Advisor, to first present the results of the survey we did amongst the full youth membership of the Sun Movement, and, uh, and then we'll come back to introducing the, the speakers. Sorry, switching the mics. Um, thank you. So um, we uh, we wanted to, as as Afshan said, we wanted to bring in as many young voices as possible to COP. So we um, spread out this survey uh, far and wide on multiple networks, and we had over a hundred people sharing their thoughts, and they had a lot to say. Um, so this first slide, just we wanted to ask, you know, have have people, young people, felt the impacts of climate change? Have they seen the change in their lifetime? And you can see. Um, only 11% said there had been no change. There had been an overwhelming uh, number of people, especially at uh, this bottom area, that 41% uh, had seen extreme weather variations as a result of climate change. Um, uh, uh, given that we're limited on time, we have some quotes from some of the young people uh, when they completed, th completed this survey. There's a QR code, so at any point you can find out more about what they had to say in more detail. Um, obviously, we really wanted to know about um, the link between climate and nutrition and the situation for nutrition for young people in their country. And again, you can see here, um, a, a, again, the vast majority of uh, children and young people are, just, are not enjoying access to uh, quality nutrition. There is widespread food insecurity and malnutrition in 34% of the, um, the countries in which young people uh, responded from. And a, a clear, young people could clearly see the link between food, nutrition, and climate change when we asked them. An average rating was 7.73 when we asked how strong that link was. Now, when we asked what the biggest barriers that young people face in accessing a nutritious diet, it was very interesting. Um, what the biggest factor was uh, considered to be lack of knowledge of healthy diets. Uh, one thing that we know um, young people are doing a great job of uh, trying to address. And of course, rising food prices, one that's more difficult for young people to address because it's, it's shaped by much bigger factors, but it um, is being really felt by children and young people. Of course, lack of availability of nutritious food and lack of quality school meals were identified as um, strong factors as well. Now, we really wanted to know about the uh, role of, of key stakeholders in response to this crisis. And we asked them how they felt their government was responding. 
And you'll see here the average rating was 4.45 um, in terms of uh, how strong they thought that was. Um, so clearly young people do feel like there is more to be done by their governments and they want to see more action. Um, and it just, yeah, this general feeling from the comments, which is a general dissatisfaction, but a, an, a, 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 an eagerness to see more from their governments. And then we wanted to ask about other sectors, because we know that all sectors have a role to play. So in the private sector, there were some really um, helpful suggestions, ideas for the role that private sector to com can play when it comes to um, investing in sustainable agriculture, um, and uh, adopting um, more responsible practices as well. Civil society as well, um, we know they've got an important role to play. Um, advocacy came out really strongly when we asked them about the role they can play. Um, raising awareness, partner partnering meaningfully with young people as well, because even civil society can sometimes exclude young people from their activities and we need to make sure they're brought into the conversation. From governments, when we asked, um, we they uh, they felt like there was a big role that governments can play. Uh, stronger accountability, um, enforcing the laws that um, require governments, uh, require private sectors, um, require businesses, sorry, to adhere to good practices uh, and ensure that um, food prices are um, are manageable, um, that their activities are not exacerbating the effect on climate change. So that was a very quick uh, run through the, the survey results. I encourage you to scan the QR code and um, find out more about what the young people had to say. And we want to keep um, thinking about innov innovative ways to bring young pe people's voices into fora like these. So I'll hand back to Afshan Khan now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. I think that is an important data point in, in both hearing young people's voices, um, but it's also an important part of working alongside youth organizations as they set the agenda for action at COP uh, in particular. I'd now have the privilege of uh, asking Nana Yohari from the Democratic Republic of Congo to take the stage. Nana is a final year medical student living in the east of the country. And this year she was recruited as a Sun Civil Society Network National Youth Coordinator. Uh, Nana is in the last year of uh, medical school, um, and I think this gives her the unique opportunity to see the intersections between climate and nutrition, both from where she lives, but also from the work she does. So Nana, a warm welcome to you. Bonjour. Je m'appelle Nana Yohari. Et je suis actuellement étudiante en dernière année de médecine et coordonnatrice nationale de la jeunesse pour les jeunes leaders d'intrusion en RDC. Uh, so her name is Yohari Nana. She's in her last year of medical uh, stu study studies, and she is now the, the national coordinator for the young leaders of nutri for nutrition. Alors, comment est-ce que moi j'ai rencontré euh, la nécessité de la nutrition durant mon parcours C'est qu'en tant qu'étudiante en médecine, j'ai eu à faire certains stages de vacances et pour les faire, je suis allée à l'intérieur, en périphérie de, de ma province. So how did she get interested in the subject? As a young medical student, she had to do internships in villages and she really went to the villages and to, saw, to see what happens in there. Alors, durant mon stage, j'ai eu à voir Euh, beaucoup d'enfants qui souffraient de malnutrition et il y a eu un cas en particulier qui m'a beaucoup touché. In her internship, she witnessed a lot of actual young or kids that were really struggling with malnutrition and there is a case that really touched her. Alors c'est le cas d'un enfant qui a été emmené par sa grand-mère qui était en train d'aller rendre visite à une de ses amies. En chemin, elle a rencontré une femme nutritionniste qui lui a dit d'aller urgentement à l'hôpital parce que son enfant était parce que son petit-fils semblait être très malade. So there was a, uh, an old woman with her grandchild taking, her, taking him to visit a uh, friend, and she suddenly uh, encountered a nutritionist who actually told her the urgency of having to take the kid to the hospital. Alors, arrivé à l'hôpital, on a eu à voir l'enfant. En les regardant, on pensait qu'il avait une année, mais la grand-mère nous disait que l'enfant avait trois ans. On s'est dit peut-être qu'elle ne connaissait pas son âge, mais après nous avoir confirmé qu'il avait un petit frère d'une année, on s'est dit qu'il ne pouvait pas avoir une année, qu'il avait certainement trois ans. So when they went to the hospital, the doctors started to think that the kid was one year old, 
while asking the grandmother, apparently he was three years old. So first they doubted her his age and they doubted if she was really right. But she did say that he had a younger brother who was actually one. So he was actually three years old. Alors cet enfant était en malnutrition très sévère et on a tenté de lui donner des aliments pour qu'il puisse récupérer des aliments thérapeutiques que l'on donne aux gens qui sont mal nourris, mais malgré ces aliments, il a fait un syndrome de surnutrition que, le, que seulement les gens qui, qui sont après un jeûne, les gens qui prennent des aliments lourds après un jeûne font. Alors donc il a été en surnutrition alors que c'était un aliment très très conforme par rapport à son état. So seeing all the malnutrition, they try to give him some therapeutic uh, uh, food or therapeutic substances to actually help him to absorb more, but it turned out to be the exact opposite, and he did, uh, 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 he had the opposite problem, so he couldn't really adapt to the nutrition. It's like being fasting for an entire day and then having one big kilogram of beef. Alors, quand on a essayé de s'enseigner auprès de sa grand-mère, elle a dit que c'est parce que son enfant n'a pris que de l'eau. Après, donc, euh, le, le petit-fils n'a pris que de l'eau comme euh, aliment après l'allaitement. Ils n'ont pas su faire la transition nécessaire entre les aliments liquides et les aliments solides. C'est ce qui a justifié son état. So when they asked his grandmother, she said that the kid was only drinking water and he was eating no food. After the lactation, they didn't know how to, to do the transition from the, from the milk to the actual solid food. And he just ended up only drinking water. Alors à partir de là, moi j'ai été énormément touchée. Je me suis dit qu'il y avait un grand travail à faire au niveau de, de, la, de la question de la nutrition en matière d'information euh, auprès de toute la couche de la communauté et particulièrement les jeunes parce qu'il y a beaucoup de jeunes qui ne sont pas informés de qu'est-ce que c'est que bien manger et qu'est-ce que c'est qu'une alimentation équilibrée conformément à, au repas que l'on trouve dans les milieux locaux. So this case really touched her and that's when she started to really She, she started to face the knowledge problem and the gap problem where young, especially with young people who, don't, who do not really know how to eat and what is the local food and how they should eat it. Alors, la, la malnutrition a beaucoup d'effets sur les jeunes. Lorsque un, non, un jeune, et particulièrement les enfants de moins de 5 ans, ne mangent pas bien, ils n'auront pas la chance de pouvoir être en bonne santé, de pouvoir avoir les mêmes activités que d'autres jeunes, de pouvoir étudier et avoir de, bonne, de bons résultats scolaires et académiques de pouvoir être aussi en, donc en bonne santé, de ne pas être malade tout le temps hospitalisé euh, et donc passer une grande partie de leur euh, enfance en étant en train d'être traité. So when the young kids are actually mal malnutrition, they do face a lot of problems not being able to play, not even being able to focus on the studies, but also having too many diseases and having to spend way too much time in the hospitals. Il y a aussi les retards de développement euh, euh, donc du cerveau et à long terme aussi il y a des conséquences telles que l'exposition à des maladies telles que l'hypertension artérielle et le diabète et aussi un développement économique faible parce qu'on ne peut pas avoir de grands revenus vu qu'on n'a pas eu la chance de faire des grandes études comme d'autres enfants sous d'autres cieux. There's also a lot of problems as in development of brain and uh, problems like uh, hypertension or diabetes. So there's also the problems of not access to knowledge and not really having to do the studies that actually made that they don't even know what to eat and how to eat. Alors nous sommes à la COP28, c'est pour parler aussi des climats. Et nous connaissons très bien que le climat a, euh, entraîne des événements, donc, les changements climatiques entraînent des événements climatiques euh, extrêmes. Donc euh, il y a les sécheresses dans certains endroits, mais dans d'autres endroits, il y a des grandes pluies, telles que, on peut avoir des inondations qui ravagent les cultures et qui empêchent aux gens d'avoir accès à une bonne al alimentation. So if you're here talking about climate because of COP28, we can talk about uh, droughts, but we can also talk about a lot of rain and a lot of floods. And this actually stands in the way of people getting access to, to a proper nutrition. Alors j'ai parlé d'un cas dans ma communauté. Le 8 mai, il y a eu une, une inondation au sud Kivu. C'est là que je vis. Une inondation qui a entraîné à peu près 400 décès. Qui, sont, qui peuvent parfois être des chiffres, mais dans ma communauté, ce sont de frères, de sœurs, de cousins, qui, donc des gens que, que l'on connaît qui ont perdu de proches. So, the 8th of May, in her city, a flood uh, happened that actually killed 400 people. It might seem like a number, but the 400 are actually people and brothers and sisters and actually known people that were dead, unfortunately. Alors, il y, y a un monsieur de la communauté qui, a, qui avait une famille de 11 personnes et il a perdu neuf personnes, neuf d'entre ces onze personnes pendant l'inondation. Donc, ils ont passé de onze à, à deux. So there was a man in her village who, or her city, who were eleven people in the family, and he 
more unfortunately lost nine people in the flood so they went from 11 people to two people in the family donc le, le changement climatique est une question qui, qui doit absolument être abordée auprès de jeunes auprès de toute la couche de la communauté euh, une fois j'ai essayé de, de, de causer avec de jeunes étudiants en leur demandant qu'est-ce que c'était que le charbon en rapport avec euh, le réchauffement climatique, ils m'ont dit que c'était les charbons dont c'est servi pour cuisiner. Ils ne savaient pas euh, qu'il y avait des extractions de, de charbon. Donc, il y a un manque d'informations en matière de réchauffement climatique au niveau de la communauté. So this is why there's uh, more knowledge is used because, for example, she tried to ask her friends what is carbon and its relation to the climate change, and they answered that it's the one we use to cook and that we take from the trees and burn and have it the, the chop. Alors, ce que nous demandons, c'est que ils puissent avoir une grande sensibilisation, une grande information auprès de jeunes que l'on puisse pouvoir informer aux jeunes euh, de qu'est-ce que c'est que le réchauffement climatique, les appeler aussi à prendre part à des débats. Parce que euh, c'est une question qui nous concerne aussi, parce que dans quelques années, nous sommes euh, la dernière fenêtre de tir, selon le rapport du GIEC, pour que nous puissions pouvoir agir, pour avoir un lendemain, un, un avenir meilleur. Alors si nous n'agissons pas maintenant, nous les jeunes, nous serons perdus dans quelques années. So there is really a lack of knowledge and this is what we, we need to, to grab more people, encourage more people to, in, to uh, be in the talk and actually participate in the debates to have them more uh, into, in the circle and knowing more about the subject. Donc c'est pour ça que nous demandons aux parties prenantes qui sont ici présentes et à tous les autres de bien vouloir intégrer les jeunes dans la lutte et dans toutes les questions en matière des réchauffements climatiques et de nutrition. Merci beaucoup. This is why we're actually asking the stakeholders here, but also stakeholders all over the world, to actually grab more uh, youth people and encourage them to participate more in the debates. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nana, for, for I think, pulling those elements together very, very succinctly. Um, I'd now like you to introduce you to Hector de Lasta. Um, Hector is a representative of uh, YPARD, Young Professionals for Agricultural Development, and has worked on projects involving socio-biodiversity chains, agroforestry systems, ecological restoration, tourism in natural areas, and financial mechanisms to conserve biodiversity and navigate climate challenges. So we very much also appreciate having your experiences and insights. Hello, thank you very much. Thank you for everyone being here and sharing your time with us. My name is Eitor Delasta. I work as a conservation and climate finance senior analyst at a nonprofit organization in Brazil called Sitawi that aims to uh, unlock uh, nation resources for social and environmental positive impact. And I'm the Brazilian country representative for the Young Professionals for Agricultural Development, YPARD, uh, which aims to connect enable action and capacity youth, rural youth specific from global to local level, and is the youth co-host for this food system pavilion. So first, I would like to bring two quick introduction about what I'm going to say. One is that we are all sharing this space because we think that we need to rethink our food systems. So we need to think broadly about our food systems, and this means that we need to think about an integral perspective. So blue food systems, uh, are very important in this discussion and is a different type of approach that most of the times it's not put on the decision make, making table and it's commonly absent from most of the sustainable discussions regarding food systems. So we already have evidence that um, blue food, which means food that comes from marine but also from fresh water, um, have uh, environmental I positive impacts, especially when compared to uh, animal proteins that livestock, but also uh, nutritional health perspectives from different um, socio-ecological realities, again, specifically when you compare it from another types of animal protein. Uh, and of course, the blue food is also very important if we consider different types of indigenous peoples and local communities that have their own types of cultural uh, dimensions uh, regarding food systems. The second thing is to introduce uh, Mido Juruá territory the, that is located in the Brazilian Amazon. Mido Juruá territory has a giant socio-ecological importance, of course, because it's located in the Brazilian Amazon. So this means that uh, we are located in a high ecological importance area with 
uh, two natural protected areas regarding involvement with human aspects. So we have uh, extractivist natural area and also um, development sustainable extractivist area. And we share uh, the land with indigenous peoples from the river Shirwa. Uh, Jurua is a really important source of fishing in the whole Amazon. And most of all, Jurua is a, have a high socio-political organization where we have local communities, mm, uh, around seven and eight local organizations that organize themselves for taking all the decision-making process from local level. So when we are talking about uh, the Jurua, Middle Jurua River, we are specifically talking about one social biodiversity chain, which is the Arayama or Pirarucu management. So Pirarucu is a giant fish, as you may see. Uh, it's the biggest fish of the freshwater in Amazon. And we used to say that the Pirarucu management shared two different uh, periods. It's a process that go for us the whole year. We have the fishing period where is the period that we are most usable to know where people from communities go for fishing, but also for cleaning, uh, for uh, going uh, for cooking, cleaning. Most women take care of this part and most of them are invisible in the chain, uh, but also take about logistic bowls and all the process for collecting data. But the other process that goes Furthermore, than these two or three months of fishing period is that these communities also work directly in the management, and that's what we call management, not only fishing, on uh, no fishing period. So these communities organize themselves for different types of counting, the pirarucu, so they need to count to have the uh, IBAMA, which is the environmental uh, organization in Brazil that allows the fish of the pirarucu, they do vigilance, that means that they protect the natural areas that they are. So they do daily a uh, routine to protect these natural areas where they share their own resources to keep these uh, lakes uh, aware from different um, possibilities of unsustainable use. So just for you letting you know, this year two different boats of illegal mining was identified by the local communities because of their vigilance. And they were identified the previous of the government. Uh, and this also means a lot of social mobilization because they are eight different local organizations that need to sit together, that need to do their own assemblies, that need to take their own decision-making process and organize all everything around the period of fishing, how much fishing they are going to, uh, to collect, and how they are going to sell this fish and all the structure. So here we have some pictures to understand exactly what we are talking about. And one important thing to consider is that when we are talking about these different types of food systems, we are actually talking about different perspectives about positive impacts for both people and nature. So we are uh, talking about that when you are ta when you are organizing the pirarucu management, we are at the same time doing sustainable livelihoods, biodiversity conservation, but also social cohesion. So the pirarucu man management, we already had evidence that if you are managing pirarucu, all the other species that goes under pirarucu because pirarucu works as an umbrella species in the ecosystems grow together with it. So this is what we are talking about, biodiversity conservation. Uh, the direct protected area, which means the lake, uh, are around 4,000 hectares. But the area that communities walk to go for fishing and everything around, which include the terrestrial ecosystems for around their walk through, are around 32,000 um, hectares. So we are talking about a giant area of primary Atlantic, primary Amazon forest in Brazil that the local communities protect by themselves. Uh, and Pirarucu, as I mentioned, supports the diversification of other fish and at the same time uh, seed dispersal. Sustainable livelihoods mean that this management 
both goes for sale, so they have an income that comes directly from this, but at the same time, we are talking about uh, nutritional support, because this is what they eat, and as I mentioned, they don't, do not only eat pirarucu, that's not the point, but as pirarucu is an uh, umbrella species, all the other fishes that they have in the lakes come together and increase their uh, uh, food sovereignty inside of the communities. And at the same time, this biodiversity conservation needs a different aspect of social cohesion. So they need to have all their structures, local structures organized, so they can have the whole process going on. So when we think about the sustainable food systems, we are actually talking about how can we rethink the way that we are supporting food systems, how we are rethinking the way that we are funding food systems. And this structure uh, uh, can really bring us some insights to understand that the organization needs to prioritize social cohesion, biodiversity conservation, sustainable live livelihoods, which means that we have different types of structures that can fund, that can support it. Of course, that we have the traditional markets that support this, so they buy uh, the fish, but we also have different types of uh, financial and non-financial structures that can support it with uh, different types of resources, specifically for the other dimensions that we're talking here, so food, security, nutritional health, biodiversity conservation. There are, and probably there should not be markets for this, but this doesn't mean that we should not uh, create incentives for people to be over there. So that's the point for us to enhance all the ecological, economic, and social cultural benefits for us to understand a little bit better how are we creating more uh, sustainable food systems. So, Yes, I think it's <laughs> a little mess, this one. But the point is, to close in my, my speech, why we started exactly the title about true value of food systems is exactly the point to understand that we've, we are living a value crisis. And that's not me saying, but that's the last IPBS report saying that we live a values crisis, which means that only monetary and economic value are put are put in the decision-making table. When you're talking about youth-led action, but I will also add, when you're talking about indigenous and local communities, women and youth, we are major groups that work together, we are talking about different types of values that need to be arranged. We are talking about care, we are talking about justice, we are talking about stewardship. So my main point here is, are we ready, or how can we start organizing these things and putting these different types of values that I hope it was clear in the presentation to make more sustainable and justice uh, decision-making process. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much. And I think um, that whole reframing of the social justice equity issues becomes so key. And I think, Nana, the two of you have a lot to talk to about because Lake Bukavu, <laughs> and the lake there, there's also quite a bit to be done. So let me just now take the opportunity to welcome Andrea Alferi, the Deputy Head of UNIT at the Director General for International Partnerships at the European Commission. He's been covering the position of Coordinator on Climate Change and Sustainable Energy Teams within the Commission. So it's a privilege to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, we have some music as well, so it's perfect. No, um, thank you very much, and also thanks to the, the two panelists. Um, I think uh, they highlighted two different perspectives of um, what they um, face in their respective uh, countries. Um, I have to say, I say to Nana that my, my daughter is entering medicine studies this year, so I want to congratulate that you managed to get to the end, and I hope that she will be able to, do, to follow the same, the same path. Um, we were supposed to, let's say, think and reflect a little bit upon what, what, you, just, uh, what you just showed us. Um, I have to say, um, it's uh, you know uh, for me it's quite it's quite striking how to see how climate change uh, is affecting us uh, everywhere 
um, in 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 such a different uh, manners. We we are at COP. We we are discussing um, very very different uh, issues, but all linked to to climate change. One moment it's energy, the other moment is transport. Today is nutrition, forests, environment, of course, natural resources, water. Um, already after two days, I've been in a broad range of uh, of events covering basically all uh, all topics. Um, I think. What I get uh, also from from your uh, from your intervention is the complexity, of course, of of uh, of this uh, uh, of this agenda. Um, there are many stakeholders involved. They are not affected all uh, in uh, uh, in the same way. Um, it has to be. Uh, it it calls uh, each of us to go through um, individual changes in the way we 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 live. Um, but also societal uh, changes. So it's the, the, the complexity there um, means that this discussion, of course, goes beyond the individual and, and enter a society at large. Um, what Ato presented um, in, uh, in, uh, in, his, uh, in his intervention, uh, this true value of, uh, uh, of, of food or, or, let's say, um, I think it's it's an important point in the sense that climate change is obliging us to see things in a different way. Uh, the use that we do of resources, any type of resources, but particularly natural resources, um, I think is 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 changing. What what type of food we buy or we eat, what type of transport we take, um, the going beyond, let's say. Uh, what what we were seeing in things before and understanding the true value that uh, is behind every choice that we make in terms of consuming one thing or the other I think this is a uh, this is an important point and and I'm glad that uh, young people which is uh, the, the central element of this of this panel uh, are helping us to see things in a different way to help us to make choices in a different way more conscious more aware of the, the value, the intrinsic value of um, what we consume or what we do uh, in, our, uh, in our daily life. Of course, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is a, is, a, is a complex agenda and I think uh, Nana has also highlighted, um, I would say, uh, I noted down the issue of, of knowledge that you mentioned many times. It's one important element in order to make um, choices uh, that uh, bring us into the right direction in terms of reducing our impact on, on this planet. We need to have a certain awareness. We need to make sure that people across the world, because it affects everybody, has a certain knowledge of what is climate, how climate is affecting uh, what we do, uh, but also knowledge to help people, as I said, to make the right decision. In, the case, in your case, it was about consuming a um, certain type of food or having a healthy diet or be aware that if you are uh, malnourished in the first uh, X number of days of your life, this will have, uh, let's say, chronic effects or permanent effects. Um, I say, representing the European Commission today here, um, I, I think from from uh, from our point of view, um, over the past years, the topic of climate change and how it affects uh, our lives, not just in Europe but across the world, uh, has been a central topic of of this particular mandate of, of this commission. Uh, President von der Leyen uh, spearheaded uh, um, a huge legislative package with the EU Green Deal uh, in, uh, in 2019. And I see that it's touching upon many of, of the sectors that I mentioned uh, so far, from forest to water to sustainable energy. Europe really uh, embarked in, a, um, in, a, in a, an ambitious plan of rethinking and resettling its its economic, societal, and, and development mode. Um, and I have to say, working in the DG of international partnerships, so dealing with international cooperation with third countries, we ourselves uh, have been, uh, let's say, asked to change the way we do international cooperation, to put climate change at the core of what we do, 
this translates into objectives that we have to follow in terms of budgetary commitments. We have to dedicate uh, uh, more than 30% of our budget for international cooperation, for instance, to, to the fight uh, against climate change. But it also spurred uh, a lot of uh, initiatives on forest, on water, on sustainable energy, and on food uh, that I would say go into uh, into this this uh, this direction. I, I think it's a it's a long um, it's a long walk, but at the same time it has to be quicker. I think we all understood uh, coming here that uh, the window of opportunity that we have um, as as global population is restricting. Uh, so we need to speed up. And I have to say that um, I think uh, uh, young people, uh, as Ashraf said, um, can be very innovative by nature, I would say, because they are young and, and innovation comes uh, from, from young people. But they can also help us to, uh, you know, get to speed, get to action uh, more uh, more quickly, uh, put the system under pressure to, to act uh, more quickly and uh, in the right in the right direction. So offering solutions, but also push decision makers to act more quickly because, uh, uh, of course, the world of tomorrow is belongs uh, belongs to to them. I stop here because Ashraf is already looking at me as like stop because uh, there's no time. So I'll, I'll give it back the floor to you. Thank you, Andrea, and, and I really appreciate, I think, the, the co you're pulling together the different aspects, but also the Commission's role in so integrating climate very strongly into the work. It's now uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Paul Garakochea, Head of Directorate Sustainable Supply Chains, Agriculture and Food Systems at the German uh, Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. Um, it's an honor to have you here as well, and please, let me ask you to come to the podium. Thank you. Thank you very much um, uh, for the invitation and uh, especially to, to the young people um, Nana and uh, Heito for their presentation, which were inspiring, really. And actually, what I got from Nana's presentation is that, um, you know, apart from this devastating experience you were showing to us uh, about this grandchild, uh, three years old, but looking like a one year, that's uh, amazing and it shows that malnutrition is sometimes irreversible so we have to think about from a perspective of uh, acting now and not waiting uh, too much that's why what i get it from your um, presentation the th the the notion of a knowledge gap about healthy food which is obviously very very important and uh, definitely uh, participation in the debate from young people I think is key this is a central part of what we are learning today from you um, from Eitor thank you also excellent um, presentation uh, I learned a lot from uh, Yurua River and the Pikaruku fish but it wasn't in the center. What you wanted to convey, I think it's the importance of local communities and how to organize local organization and how to deal with sustainability, live, uh, livelihoods, biodiversity, conservation, and social cohesion. So trying to figure out that this is much more than management of fishery. So this is what I gathered from you. And this is, uh, I think, uh, the most important part of this event today that we listen to young people not we don't have the recipes but we need to uh, listen to you and to all experience and all your perspectives that you are gathering because then we learn and then we can translate that into action uh, in in our um, in our responsibility in our government so thank you very much for that presentation um, I just want to say that the influence and the voice you have young people have is much more than only saying and trying to make us listen uh, I know you challenge your parents your uh, 
older people, and I know that also um, from from my own uh, from my own experience with my kids, they don't they don't just take what we say as parents. They really want to listen because they challenge us, and the challenge is the most important part that you can. So your 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 influence goes beyond of your own experience it, it really it really is an important element of, of, of your influence and, and the voice you have in terms of uh, what we can offer you from from a governmental perspective is that we yes uh, are in the center of our work is uh, to to bring uh, youth organization and networks and agripreneurs uh, in the in the as a role model um, into into working with us and giving giving us some background of of how we are dealing with this problem. So uh, we see the catalytic role of the scaling up nutrition mov um, movement that a place uh, that 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 is really a support for young people in this field. Uh, in terms of the link between nutrition and climate change. It is slowly getting more international attention, and this is really important. Uh, as, as you said before, climate change contributes to all forms of malnutrition and influences other underlying factors of malnutrition, uh, such as unsustainable food system, poor public health, risk of conflict, and vulnerable li livelihoods. But the reverse is also true. It's our incre increasingly unsustainability dietary patterns become a major driver of climate change. So um, let me just stop here uh, saying that uh, German cooperation is dedicated to f support uh, those affected by malnutrition and the impacts of climate change and recognizes that youth is particularly vulnerable to climate change. To equip those leaders of tomorrow with the right tools, uh, German cooperation has generated evidence that multi-sectoral nutrition interventions lead to increased household resilience to shocks and multiple crises. Um, youth led action is one important lever for societal development which can be used and should be strengthened to make our societies fit for the challenges ahead. Consider German cooperation and BMZ as partner, and I wish you all the best for, for, for your work. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I'm now really pleased to welcome Sophie Hilithau, a rep youth representative on the Sun Need Group and founder of Act for Food, a youth-led movement to transform food systems. And she'll be doing the final closing remarks. So over to you, Sophie. And I just want to say thank you all for all of you who joined and to thank Peter and uh, Nana because I think we also got a very good sense of how youth are calling for a paradigm shift in actually how we look at the intersection between nutrition and climate. And those of us working in this area also have to reframe a little bit how we work, who we work with, and what we do. So with that, Sophie, over to you. Thank you so much, Afshan, and thank you so much to all the speakers. I, I came in a little bit late because my flight got delayed, so I've come straight from the airport. So excuse my wrinkled shirt is <laughs> the best I could do. Um, but Yes, I'm really sorry to miss Nana's speech. I hope I can catch up with you after. And I, I got half of yours, hey, Tor, but I really understood the interconnectedness of what you were trying to um, showcase, that biodiversity, social cohesion, um, nutrition, community building, capacity building of young people and working with indigenous networks is really key to everything we do, especially when we look at the linkages between climate action and food systems transformation. And right now, young people are the largest generation of young people to ever exist. We're also the most connected 
generation of young people to ever exist, whether that's through community spheres, um, online. So that gives us a lot of power in whatever we do, whether that's um, offline or online in all our actions. And that's something that I think leaders and decision makers in the, the public, private and governmental sector really have to consider because these are the young people that have the future of our populations, of our world, of our biodiversity in the palm of their hands, whether that's through economical decisions or voting mechanisms. And what I really want to showcase is that a lot of the young people that we see doing incredible work today are in the informal sector of society. Um, they have a lack of access to financing, they have a lack of access to capacity building mechanisms as well, and this is something that really does need to change. As you said, um, that we need to listen to young people more, but I challenge you and say that we need to work with young people more. Young people cannot just be the beneficiaries of programs and policies created, but must be the co-creators of these policies. When I look at the um, national pathways coming out of the UN Food Systems Summit, a large majority of them mention capacity building for young people within food systems transformation, but very few of them are created with young people. So I'd like to see a shift in this and bring people like Nana, like Haytor and others that can't gain access to rooms like this into spaces where they can be co-creators. And to do that, I really believe that decision maker makers need to go to the young people because they don't know that they can come to you. <laughs> So what I really call for is, is more co-creation, more co-implementation, and more co-decision making within spaces so that we can have youth-led action to transform um, our food system through climate and resilient ways. Um, and with that, I'm sorry, I'm very rushed with one minute left. Um, I would like to thank the Scaling Up Nutrition movement for creating a space for young people to be able to do so, um, for the Young Professionals in Agriculture Research Development for creating that capacity building guide for people like Haytor to implement, and also to BMZ and the EU Commission for entering a space like this and beginning to think about working with young people in more innovative ways. Um, and I hope that you can reach out to Nana and Haytor later and have discussions with them on ways forward, because I think that would be really excellent. And with that, thank you so much. Thank you.